Hey everybody, if you haven't heard, we're having our first ever Producers Perspective Pro Super Conference. I'm super excited about it. It's Saturday, November 11th and Sunday, November 12th of this coming year. Get all the information and register on the producersperspective.com. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective podcast. Very special day today because we're debuting a brand new microphone. I know many of you out there are happy to literally hear that. I am Ken Davenport. I'll be your host today. Today, we're going to hear the perspective of a woman who has done it all in this business, general manager, produce, you name it. Please welcome to the podcast, Tony Warburton with Nancy Gibbs. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. So Nancy is one of the principals of 321 Management, the general managers of this season's War Paint, as well as a dozen plus other huge shows on Broadway from Next to Normal, The Graduate, Bring It On, Oh Hello, and that little green show, Wicked. As a producer, she was behind the Tony Ward winning Fun Home, Peter and the Star Catchers on the Come From Away team, and many, many, many more. I've literally been doing this general magic producing for like three decades now. More. Bio red. More. <laughs> the bio's out of date. So. <laughs> and a ton of work off Broadway, which I really want to get into. You're okay. one of those few producers and managers who are really dedicated to that struggling patient, which I very much appreciate. You and I started on a similar path. I started as a company manager, general manager, producer. Tell me how you got into the biz originally. Where did it start? I actually went to, um, af- I, I, I taught graduate school for, I, I taught college for a year as a fill-in at the University of Northern Colorado, of all places. After I was done with that, I went to a non-union dinner theater in Greeley, Colorado, and went met a group of people who were going to go to San Francisco to put on a show. And so eight of us trekked to San Francisco, and we did a show in a church off of Polk Street in 1976. And we all, after we did our show, which everybody did everything, and I acted and did the costumes and produced it, basically. And I... Once we finished our show, we all went to school at ACT for acting. That was the end of my acting career. That was way too intense for me. And so, but in order to make a living, I worked at um, a play, uh, the, there was a piano bar called the Curtain Call across from the current theater in San Francisco. It's now the Starbucks. And all the show people would go to that bar after the theater. And we, they would drink and drink until the bar closed. And it was a very interesting time. The Civic Light Opera played the current theater at that time. There's no way those musicals would ever fit in the current theater now. And in fact, I, I just was thinking of it recently because I just saw Pacific Overtures. And the first time I saw Pacific Overtures was at the current. The whole cast would come over to uh, drink at the bar, close the bar down. And then we would all go to Chinatown to have Chinese food, and Mako, who was the original reciter, because it was the original Broadway cast that played San Francisco, would order off the menu. And um, my favorite story is a friend of mine was there one night, and she said, show me how to use chopsticks, and Mako handed her a fork. (laughs) So anyway, so that, at that, the current, uh, at the curtain call, I met my first theatrical manager, and he had me work box office at the current theater. There was a sold-out show that Catherine Hepburn was starring in. It was before credit cards for tickets. All orders were unpaid. So you took unpaid reservations for the entire house at the theater. And so I was a phone person and um, took orders and uh, learned box office. And the treasurer was beginning to lose it a little bit. And the manager there said, why don't you check her statement every night to make sure she's getting it right? And I met my first company manager and I realized that you could be good in theater and good in math and be in the theater, and that was the way to go. And so the manager of that theater said, well, if you want to be a company manager, you need to go to New York. So I packed my trunk. I, in the meantime, had met some folks playing at the Marines Memorial Theater in Vanities, in which Patricia Richardson was one of the understudy. And one of the stage managers said, well, you can stay with me. I live on West 73rd Street, so come on and stay with me when you get to New York. So I moved to New York with my trunk, and I worked at a bunch of jobs that I was just losing money on, including the Equity Library Theater, and as a treasurer. And I started 
talking to people and interviewing, I met with uh, the management of the Wiz National Company. So my profession, professional career started with the Wizard of Oz, and it's still important to my career. <laughs> and they basically said, can you be in Toronto next Thursday? So I quit my day job and packed my suitcase, and sure enough, there was the, one of those giant storms where nothing moves in New York. So I stuck in, in New York for about five days before I was able to go to Toronto to be the assistant company manager for the Wiz National Company. I did that for 18 months and then came back to New York, and I've been in New York ever since. It's so funny because I have a similar story getting one of those calls like, can you be in this city by tomorrow at 3? And that kind of flexibility and the ability to be like, to say, yes, I'll get there seems to start a lot of careers in this business because we don't know what we need until the last second. Right. In fact, most people, when they interview for a job, I say, when they say, when do you want me to start? You say, yesterday. And that's the way. And you have to be willing to just go with it and figure out whatever damage control you need to do in order in your life in order to just move. And um, so evidently I was able to do that. But I was uh, that out on that show for about 18 months, came back. And um, I, I did a, a couple of short runs on Broadway. And then I got a job working for um, Albert Poland off Broadway, uh, first on Tom Foolery and then on Little Shop of Horrors. And so that was the beginning of Little Shop, was the beginning of working on long runs. I mean, we always say in our office that everybody opens and shows, opens and closes shows and do a great job at it. But we really understand how to keep a show running, which is not always easy, as you well know. So let's talk about that. Let's jump a little bit. So what... What makes everyone would think, oh, it's a long running show. The hard part's over. You can sit back and just coast it, right? Wicked. You can just ride it on into the Yellow Brick Road sunset. No, what's the. No, uh, basically, the, because there's so many people involved with the show, there is a lot of people maintenance that has to be done. There, you have constant, the union contracts change yearly, so everything changes that way. And you just need to make sure that the show is not. Uh, ignored and feels supported and is by both an audience as well as backstage. I mean, it's fascinating to me, but actors, they, it's not enough to just have a paycheck. You need an audience and you need the producers or the managers to acknowledge you. I mean, that's just part of what the business is about. So it's about I mean, maintenance on, on Wicked right now. Not only does the physical production wear out when the show's been running for both 15 years, so you have to make major decisions about what to replace, when to replace it, how to replace it, but also the, we're very avid about keeping uh, Wicked as one of the top grossing shows on Broadway, and that takes a major marketing endeavor because so much of our industry these days makes the Broadway is a discount business, and we're, we work very hard to make sure that Wicked is not a discounted show, and that is not easy. There are only a few shows that are able to do that. Uh, more recently, but you know, we've, we've kept it at top of mind to keep people coming. So in order to keep people coming to the show, we have to increase the funnel. And so that's one of the things that we look at on Wicked is the marketing is very crucial. So if general managers have to do so many things, right? Someone once described it to me as part accountant, part lawyer, part babysitter. What is the thing you spend the most of your time on now? Well, in our management structure, we have three major uh, people, and one one of our partners is the upfront person who gets who helps to get the jobs. We'll be in the interviews together, but seals the deal, does the major contracts, the theater, the author, the director. Uh, one partner is the day-to-day -day person, is the calendar and um, personnel casting, and I basically say I back clean up because I'm the financial manager. So I'm basically the one that when I, you work with the budgets, but the real numbers, the way you keep running is do the, what do the numbers say? And I often say, he who controls the numbers controls the show. So you can have everything else going for you, but if the numbers are out of control, you've got a problem. And has what you focus on from a daily basis most you focus on every day change from when you started? What's the big shift you've seen in how shows are managed from back when you started to today? Well, when I started, the general managers off-Broadway, you literally did everything. 
there was no marketing director, there was no technical director. And I started out a little shop where they were re uh, completely revamping the theater, and I would go at 11 o'clock in the morning where we would say hello to our seat, the people who were installing the seats, and at 11 o'clock at night I would be there when the theater people, because of course the theater people worked at night, so you can't afford other vendors to work at night. And so we would basically do two shifts, two 12-hour shifts. So one was about the seats and one was about the set. And so we really were literally had to be there at all times in order to figure out what was going on. And so you really, the general managers did all of that. But I also worked on shows at that time that if it got a bad review, it closed before you made it through the week. I worked in one office. There was an office actually in this very building. And the producer had um, both an off-Broadway show and a Broadway show. And within a month, they both closed in one night, and there was no closure, there was no notice, it was done, because there wasn't a marketing person saying, I can save this show, I can make it work, oh, let just get me to the Tonys. So, if only those marketing people were right to have the time. Yeah. Once in a while they are, but uh, back then it was, if you got panned, it was over. I mean, and there was no internet, so you did not have the, the word of the people, so you, you could say, oh yeah, the people love us. But if the critics didn't love you, that was it. And now we have a lot more people on shows, from marketing directors to technical supervisors, all these additional staffers. Do you sometimes think we've gotten too big? Yes, because I also find that people, they, they only feel like they only get their big break once, so they never say no to anybody. And so the, the budgets explode, and really any show that's really much over $12 million, 12 to $13 million, is going to have a really difficult time paying back unless they're a mega hit. So it makes me very nervous when the, the numbers keep going up and up, which is partly a product of the personnel. And it's also just nobody says no. And I just think that a show, sometimes if we can simplify things and not throw everything technically at a show, it's... um better appreciated and will have a longer life. I don't know how to get people to do that. But the shows that I love the most are the shows that I feel have a long tail that will reach people like me who grew up in Denver and will get there. That will get there. And um, so I'm very supportive of the shows that I think are going to have a long life beyond Broadway. So let's segue because you're obviously a very prolific producer as well. And as you hear, you already start to tell me what you look for. But interestingly enough, you, you, what I love about what you produced is you just said you look, oh, what has a long tail that will get to me in Denver. But you produce some pretty challenging stuff. Well, yes. I mean, in part, it, it has, but you have to believe that it can have that, that long life. And actually, Fun Home, the licensing for Fun Home is doing very, very well. We're really thrilled. And we learned with both Peter the Starcatcher and Fun Home that if, once you close your Broadway run and you go on the road, the subsidiary rights really begin to go because people know the show. I mean, we're very insular and isolated on Broadway, and we think everybody in the country knows what we're doing, and they really don't. And so I think it's really important that um, if a show can afford to go on the road, that will help their, their subsidiary life for a very long time. So there is a significant difference between a show that opens and closes here in New York at that subsidiary value, even if it has an okay run here, and a show that opens and closes with a tour. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that Peter and the Starcatcher, we did 10 months on Broadway, 10 months off Broadway, and 10 months on the road. And this year we have 100 productions, uh, no, sorry, 1,000 productions nationwide. Amateur, but uh, both the community theater, high schools, so it's it's really beginning to take off. So and really add to the canon, which is one of my goals in the shows that I really love. And two of the shows that I'm very intrigued by this season are both Come From Away and The Play That Goes Wrong, both of which I think are going to have a very uh, long tail. Yeah, I mean, we, we share that in common is that's one of the big things that I pitched my investors and analyzed very closely is will this show go on from here? Talk to me a little bit more about those about what you're attracted to as a producer, because the other thing I see is fun home, comfortable way. These are big spectacles that you would think. Do you, do you like shows that are similar I like, or cheaper? 
No, it's not about cheaper. It's about theatricality. I think we live in a world, we can't compete with the movies and TV. We cannot do what they do with green screen and all of the special effects that they, they can do. And I think we sometimes put too much physical production on the show. And you want the, the heart of the show to really come through. So I love incredibly theatrical productions. I mean, the first show I produced was Bat Boy. And uh, that was that's a show that's it's it's had a long tail with high school students. It didn't really have a long tail because we were uh, we opened in March of 2001, and about Labor Day 2001, we thought we were turning it around, and then we weren't. So uh, we uh, we closed at uh, 9/11. We reopened three weeks later, and we ran two more months. We limped through two more months, and uh, subsidiary rights basically paid back the priority loan in the, the 10 years because Off-Broadway has a much shorter subsidiary life than Broadway. But it's still being done out there. One of my favorite shows. That was a real golden age of Off-Broadway at that point. Oh, it was indeed. It was indeed. That show was fantastic. Scott Schwartz directed, who's been on this podcast, and Chris Catelli, of course, mm-hmm. who really gave his birth to his career. Right, and right, right. It was very, very, yes. very great show. Well, let's talk a little bit about Off-Broadway because mm-hmm. you're very active in that space. You general managed uh, I Love Your Perfect Now Chain. Right? Nine of its 12 years, yes. Right? And a whole bunch of other shows. What do you think about its current state? And we were on a panel together. I yes, we were a long time ago. <laughs> in theater, we all have that's to right, up that's a right, that's I, still right. get, I still get emails about that. We were on a panel about successfully commercial, commercial producing on Broadway. Must have been 2005. Well, so 2005. we wouldn't we wouldn't have gotten a panel like that today, no. would we? It's 2017. Twelve years later, what do you think about the current state of commercial? Mm, I think it's very sickly. I, I think we. I started off Broadway. I started working on off Broadway in the mid 80s through the early 2000s and had to have multiple shows in order to make a living. But I had at at 9/11 we had four shows running. That boy was the only one that didn't survive. I love you, Della Guarda, and Vagina Monologues all were running at that time. And they all, we scurried and made deals and uh, got waivers and did whatever we needed for the shows to survive. But it really, somehow the, first of all, Broadway was not thriving from the 80s. I mean, I'm amazed. In the 80s, half of the Broadway theaters were dark. And they were trying to do whatever they could to get people. No one was doing plays at all on Broadway. And it's still not easy to do a play on Broadway, but so off Broadway people went turned off Broadway, and there were it was a heyday, and somehow the finances were just about right. The rents weren't too high, the advertising wasn't too expensive, and it wasn't as expensive as Broadway, and you did small, uh, intimate shows. Um, I mean, the biggest show you could do was about ten, ten actors. So Little Shop was was 10 and Bat Boy was 10 and so that really helped the, the now you can I'm not sure you can do even four actors off Broadway and make it survive I don't know how to make off Broadway survive the, the numbers are just too high the theaters that you could get deals at are pretty much gone and the theaters that um, exist all have huge mortgages to pay so there's no there's no relief in the, the rent advertising is pretty much the same so it's it's um it was a very exciting time off Broadway. I mean, we had times when I had two shows at the West Side Theater, which was very exciting. So it was um it was really really something else for a while, but it doesn't exist, and I don't think it'll ever come back. You don't. Is it, there's nothing, no magic wand that you think we could wave? What, what what is there anything that we could do? Oh, I don't think the unions will take the backs. So I the, right now the salaries are too high for the economics of off Broadway because you can't you can't get your tickets low enough to undercut Broadway when every Broadway show that's struggling is advertising thirty five dollars and yes you're in the, the top row of the balcony but Broadway is still the the world of glitz and glitter and neon and all of that and you have to work it off Broadway. But there were dedicated people who would work who worked at going to off Broadway. And there's still a lot of people who go to off Broadway. But the nonprofits have really taken over that void and doing a great job. I'm doing great plays. I mean, MCC and MTC and Playwrights and Second Stage are all doing great 
uh, work in the uh, roundabout, all doing great work in particularly for plays, which is which is great. But the commercial operated theater is just incredibly, incredibly challenging, and I just don't know how you can make it work. Yeah, it seems like we've suffered at the hands of our brothers doing better. Big Broadway Correct. branded so well now, and everyone wants to go, which is great for Broadway, and the right. profits, all at theaters and multiple spaces, and, and doing great, but commercial art probably is definitely too bad, because it's a real inroads for a lot of young producers and managers. So those folks that used to get your their start off Broadway like you did, where do you think their their entry point is to our industry? Um, I think that, that because there's so many general management offices, I mean, we have a steady uh, rotation of interns through our offices, and we often hire from interns. So we have, I think, four or five interns per, basically we do uh, winter, spring, and summer. So three times a year we bring in interns. So I think that's one place they do it. And I think the nonprofits are great, although the world of nonprofit and the world of commercial theater are very different. And you really have to kind of decide, to work in commercial theater, you have to be willing to work with that net. You have to be willing to know that if this show closes, I'm out of a job, and I'm going to have to look for a new job. But so many of us have a short attention span, that works. <laughs> when you general manage a show, and then you produce a show, does your style change at all when you do both? I, I work, because we, we general manage a little bit here, right. sometimes my general manager thinks, oh, Ken's going to say no to this because it's going to cost more money, and I surprise him by saying yes. How does you fell he... into the producer trap. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. How do you control it's, yourself as a producer? That's really you? tricky. The manager hat sits much more comfortably on my head than the producer hat. So I tend to always think like a manager, and sometimes I need, I need partners to make me be more aggressive as a producer and get it out there. So I've been successful with that. It's been helpful to me to have good partners who say, no, we're going to, we've got to go do this. Um, and uh, so I think that helps. But I tend to think like a manager, even as a producer, but it, it, the producer, it's still about that vision of where can this show go? How do we get out there? And you have to, you have to have the relationship with the, with the creatives that I don't always have as a manager because sometimes someone else in the office might have that relationship. But as a producer, it feels very important that you are that you know your designers, you know uh, the author and the director, and and get to the theater uh, relatively often. I mean, I always thought of the company manager, the general manager should be there, but now I really think it's the producer who needs to get to the theater because ultimately the actors and the crew and the musicians they work, they think they work for the. Yeah, I have to reiterate that I remember just starting out as a producer and you know, on Ultra Boys and getting sidetracked with one of my other shows and realizing I just wasn't around Ultra Boys enough. And the moment I was, things just got a little bit better. Definitely. When you, you talk about partnerships, so many shows are so expensive and it takes so long and so much effort. Partners are so important, I think, now in the producing, the producing side. How do you pick up the, what do you look for? Well, I, I look for, for someone who has experience as a producer and not just as an, an investor, because a lot of investors really feel that, oh, I, I would like to do that, and that's tricky. That's a tricky, there's a big leap from being an investor or um, a, a co-producer that raises money and actually being in the room. So, and, and the room is too small to get everybody in the room. The room is the, the weekly ad meeting where you sit with the ad agencies and you figure out what's going on and that you can't really put 20 extra people in that room. So I think a lot of uh, producers today, they're having meetings with their, their co-pros uh, who represent their investors and then have the ad meetings and the, so forth on their own. So in, so I think that works pretty well. But you need a couple of really solid partners with producing experience in the room. Well, let's play a little game. Let's just imagine it this way. You're putting together a new musical team. You get to pick one of the following people. Director, composer, lyricist, and book writer. Which one would you want to pick? Which really is, which one do you think is the most important person to the development? Well, I think it's the director. I think the director has got to be the one who, first of all, they have to, they, they're only going to sign on if they think there's some value there. And also, I really never 
I've never commissioned a show, and it's not really something I'm interested in doing because I always would rather have the creatives do something that really comes from them. And I do think that sometimes commissioning means that it becomes, this is work for hire. It's not paid as though it's work for hire. It's paid as though they're full creatives. But I really think that the I like the writing team to do something that they truly want to do, that they think is important. And then the producer and the director, I think, have to decide how to best realize a shared vision. I mean, uh, from my point of view, what a producer does is three things. The producer is the person who picks the project and the team, and however that in kind of your, your game plan there. They then have to get the people to raise the money, and then they have to guide the market because they have to determine that they know how to get enough people across the threshold of the theater to pay back your $10 million investors. That's the trickiest part, because there are a lot of people who make shows, and there are a lot of, I mean, I've been a long-time board member um, of NAMP, the National Alliance of Musical Theaters, and I've seen, I was on their play selection committee for four years, and you read lots of shows, and there's some very wonderful shows, and they're just not commercial. And I don't know how to help those people, because you need that those commercial that commercial production in order to have the long life that a show needs to pay people back. So doing an obscure uh, topic or an obscure movie that's from long ago that nobody's ever heard of, I think is a real challenge these days. And because I'm not sure it's really going to, I mean, there are all of these musicals based on old movies. I'm not sure the movies have the same resonance that they may have had as a film. And if the film was done incredibly well. I'm not sure that's the right way to do it. Well, star-driven movies, I think, are really challenging because uh, I think that you want to see the stars and also you can go back after the show and go watch the movie at night, which you didn't used to be able to do. It's on demand. I imagine you spend a lot of your time negotiating. Mm, that's not my primary responsibility, usually. I negotiate more of the physical production things than, than actually the and sometimes that, and that's, that can be a challenge. I mean, I learned the hard way the um, Bat Boy designer, you know, wanted more equipment, made a deal with the shop to get more equipment for a lower price. And so when I needed help and I went back to the shop and they said, well, we really need to do 50% reduction so we can get past uh, 9 11. They said, we already gave you 50% reduction. It's like, you can't do that without telling the producer and the manager that you're doing that. You're not doing me any favors. So, because every bit of equipment is not just a piece of equipment. It's uh, prep time and loading time and maintenance time. It goes on and on and on. As a producer, how do you approach raising money from investors? Do you have a strategy? Is, what do you look for in an investor? Tell me about your I can. I try to find people that that I connect with that that like the kinds of things that I like, and and it's challenging. I think sometimes um, I've spent most of my career in this business, so most of the people I know don't have any money or don't have enough money to invest. Um, so I think that's always a, a big challenge. So what do you tell them about the risk involved? How do you tell people this is I risky? I pretty much give them the statistics that about seventeen percent of shows and. I'm, that may be an old figure, but I think it's probably about right still. 17% of shows make their money back, but it's really about supporting something that you'll be, will, um, that you're proud of, that you want to say, I was a part of that, uh, which is what we had on, on, uh, on Bat Boy. I mean, those are people, they all were adamant that that show happened, and we, it was, um, very important to them that it, it be seen. So I think it's about, and that you'll get a, they'll get a great party, and then they'll get uh, opening night tickets, which can be glamorous. But you know that if they don't, I mean, someone asked me if they should invest in Avenue Q, and I said, well, not if you don't have the money to lose. Well, that was bad advice for me, looking backward. But if if it had been the show next door, then it would have been the right advice. I think it was the right advice. I always tell my investors, write the check like you're never going to see it again. Correct. What's what is the the one single greatest change you've seen throughout your career? I know I, I think that the I think we just exploded, and I think from a financial point of view, and that makes 
crazy. I think it means that we have to have more producers in them, like more investors that really don't know anything about theater. I mean, I, I get investors who are, are going, I need, I need a report. You have to tell me right where we are. Every second it's like, well, we're really managing this show and we're juggling a lot right now. So, but a, a lot of producers do, a, do very good investor maintenance and th- that doesn't always work for shows when their investor maintenance is not as high. But I think it's just the explosion of the costs. I mean, the union costs have gone up every year. I mean, in the 80s, they were going up 10% a year. And now they're only going up 2 to 3%. But we don't have inflation in that regard. So the costs are just huge today. Both off-Broadway, on-Broadway. It's just, it's just, it's too big. Well, we're going to dovetail that into my final question, which I, I predict your, your answer already. But I'm going to, this is my genie question. So I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you. He says, I want to thank you for your 30 years of business. Amazing. Uh, by granting you one wish, what's the one thing you want this genie to wish away in an instant that would make Broadway a better place for you and for everybody? You get one wish. Everybody listening, she's shaking her head. <laughs> I'd want the genie to put it all back in a bottle. But let's go back to simple. Let's. I think we need to simplify. So I think. What, what does simple mean? To I you? think it is about going back to the roots of why we go to the theater, and that's about human connection between what's on stage and the audience. And I think we put so many things in the way of that physical production and giant. Everything. I, I, I just think that if we could could go back, just like say, I'm my the shows that I love the most are simple. Bat Boy, Striking Twelve, Play That Goes Wrong, which in its own way is a very simple show. Come From Away, certainly. I, I think that you know something like Indecent on Broadway this year. It's it's it, it doesn't mean it's inexpensive because Peter the Starcatcher people thought it was uh, two trunks and a row, and but that was. Three hundred thousand dollars with a set behind it, but three hundred thousand dollars today is cheap for a Broadway set. So it's it's really can we just go back to why, how we make that relationship work with the what's on stage? The less that get, gets in the way, the better. Uh, I I love your approach. It's artistic. No one would ever imagine you're a numbers person, and all that you want is simple and theatricality. And by the way, three hundred thousand dollars for a set—that's a house in a lot of places in this country. Totally. So even that's a lot of money. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks, all of you, for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to tell me what you think of the new microphone. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Don't forget to register for our super conference on November 11th and 12th. Check out all the information on the producersperspective.com today. We'll see you there. Oh!